Hello gardeners, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, we take that science and we apply it to all things gardening and plant care. But sometimes we like to switch things up just a little bit and get into more of the creepy crawly side of gardening and plants. And so what we like to do is we like to talk about conspiracy theories around gardening and kind of scary plants, invasive species, that sort of thing. And that is exactly what we're doing here today because in my last video where I talked about the packets of seeds showing up from China, which by the way are starting to show up in Canada and agriculture and agri-foods Canada has released a statement saying that you should contact them via email if you have received these packets. But Someone left in the comments, check out Kudzu Vine, and the rest was game over. So here today, I present to you the literal vine out of Jumanji. I'm not even joking you, the Kudzu Vine. And we are going over everything from the history, which is incredibly interesting, all the way to what made this plant so invasive, kind of the characteristics of it that make it so unbelievably good at doing its job of invading the the south and eating it but then also how we can control it and before you click off as a canadian think oh vine that ate the south i hate to break it to you lemington ontario and nova scotia have both seen kudzu vine lately in the last five or so years so as a canadian it is your job to also help prevent the spread of this literal horror movie type vine it's crazy so well, let's get into the video. So kudzu originated from Japan and in Japan it is natively found in the mountain regions where the winter typically kills off the top portion of the plant and therefore it doesn't run as rampant. But how did it get from Japan to America? Well, that happened in 1876 at the Philadelphia First World Fair and kudzu vine was actually put up on a pedestal Beside heavy hitters such as Heinz ketchup, the invention of root beer, the invention of popcorn, and the invention of Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Yes, kudzu vine was in the agriculture and horticulture display section of this entire fair, and it was touted as a mechanism for protecting the soil and preventing soil erosion. So. This vine was up beside Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. It was up beside the typewriter. Like there were so many inventions at this World's Fair. It, of course, kudzu became a heavy hit all around the world. It was, it was at the World Fair. It was classed as one of the greatest ground covers or crop covers of the, the century. So it, it blew up until around the early 20th century, around 1910-ish, that this plant started being commercially available for folks to plant in their yards. And there was two main purposes of it. The first one being to give you a shaded balcony or a veranda area to sit on because it was so aggressive in its growth. But the second reason was actually for cattle fodder. So essentially um, cattle that weren't being grazed and being kept in barns or in uh, cramped areas were fed this very high protein, uh, fast growing foliage that was cut and baled. So that is the two reasons. So that wasn't actually what was the major expansion of kudzu in the South. It didn't come until around the dirty 30s and the Dust Bowl. And if you guys want me to do a video, a creepy crawly series on the Dust Bowl and exactly the soil science behind what happened there, uh, let me know in the comments below. But essentially what the Dust Bowl was, it happened, started in 1935 and it basically took up the rest of the 1930s and it was due to poor agricultural practices that resulted in a very dusty America and portions of the prairies in Canada. And why this is so bad is because it was ripping off the topsoil of 
the land and essentially rendering cropland or agricultural land completely useless because the topsoil is where most of the nutrients reside. So the American government thought, we need to get on this, we need to fix this, we need to stop this, the loss of our topsoil and this giant dust bowl. And so they made it happen with kudzu because they saw how quickly this plant grew and they knew that this is a great way to prevent the erosion of soil. And so they funded it to the tune of 85 million kudzu seedlings 85 million you're not hearing me wrong but then to top it off they were offering 19 dollars and 35 cents american in 1930 which is around 300 dollars for every hectare of kudzu seedlings you planted Yep, $300 for every single hectare planted. And while you think, well, what's a hectare? How much could that possibly be? We'll compare that to current tree planting rates in BC. In BC, your average tree planter gets paid around $15. And in a single day, they can plant around 1,700 tree seedlings. How many seedlings are in a hectare? Well, According to the BC government's website, their recommended planting density is 1,200 plants per hectare. So that would mean people today in 2020 who plant trees plant around a hectare in the third a day and they get paid $15. In the 1930s, when everyone was out of a job, everyone was poor and people could hardly put fuel in their vehicles and they're ripping out the engine and putting horses on the back of it or on the front of it to pull it around they're paying $300 per hectare of kudzu seedlings planted it's a lot of money in the time of incredible stress so it happened 85 million seedlings they definitely got planted we didn't have to worry about that and I mean it did work it did definitely stop the erosion of soil so Good thing or bad thing? Well, I'll let you be the judge of that. Oh, by 1946, 1 1.2 million hectares of American soil was planted with kudzu seedlings. But the nail in the coffin actually wasn't so much the 85 million seedlings. It was this bug called the boll weevil. And it looks like an anteater crossed with predator. It's literally an anteater alien type looking bug that eats cotton plants. And what happened was essentially cotton farmers were completely overrun with boll weevil and they decimated the crops. And because the boll weevil rendered that land essentially useless and agricultural land is incredibly susceptible to invasive species because of just the fact that it's monocropped, it's being worked. There's not a lot of natural vegetation seedlings left in that profile. Um, natural mechanical and chemical methods that have removed the foliage basically leaves a barren wasteland in a sense um, that makes it very appetizing to invasive species to move into. And uh, anything that grows aggressively will lovingly take over that uh, cotton field that is left unattended and because the farmers were leaving no one was purchasing the land because it was essentially useless couldn't grow cotton on it there was this massive bug infestation well kudzu decided to move in and was literally left unchecked on tens of thousands of hectares of land across the united states and uh, it took over 1953, 77 years after kudzu landed on American soil, it was taken off the recommended cover crops by the United States Department of Agriculture. Just taken off the cover crops list. It wasn't until 1970 that it was considered a weed and therefore you could remove it, kill it, damage it, whatever with it. But other than that, nothing really much of any control was put on it wasn't until 1997, 101 years, that it was finally 
deemed a noxious weed and once noxious weed label is placed on a weed in the United States of America, it is considered illegal to harvest, plant, seed, transport, any form of that plant, dead, alive, part of nothing. You can't touch the plant. You, you can kill it, but you cannot move it anywhere across state lines or even within the state itself. It is incredibly illegal to do so. It's actually so illegal to the point that if you planted kudzu seedlings and the United States government found out, they could technically seize your land and completely block it off and do whatever they need to to try to remove that invasive species from the area or stop the spread of it and simply just kick you off until it's done, um, which can take years. So to put that into perspective, that is how illegal this plant is to own in the United States as an ornamental or a cover crop, anything. So is a noxious weed after 101 years on American soil. And rightfully so, because at this point it has taken over 3 million hectares of American land. It is expanding at a rate of 150 thousand hectares per year and it costs around six million dollars annually just to control and by control i mean they're doing the bare minimum just to keep it off things like power pole and infrastructure such as signs hydro like just basic infrastructure that is it six million dollars a year so why does it spread so well well it's got some pretty neat properties to it and actually when i was looking this plant up and kind of looking at the characteristics and the profile of it i was actually relatively impressed with exactly why this plant is doing so well and uh, it makes sense why it's doing so well because it's got some very unique attributes to it the first one being that it generally is cloning itself over and over again, which means it's spreading from the root system or from the vining system or from the, the stem system of the plant itself. And it expands at a rate of what I calculated to be 15 centimeters or five inches a day, which is around three feet a week. And I'm just looking at, because I just wanted to read my notes and kind of the research that I looked at. But what I had read is in some cases, they say it can grow a foot a day. I don't know. That seems like a lot to me um, based on its characteristics and kind of its plant profile that I've read. Uh, 15 inches or five inches a day seems a lot more reasonable to me, but there are claims that it can grow up to 12 inches a day, which may be the case when it's you know in full sun, lots of water, that sort of thing. Um, maybe when it gets into like your average conditions, which would be shaded or something, it, it slows down a little bit, but it's still very aggressive. I mean, five inches a day, three feet a week, that's huge. In two weeks, it's, it's basically grown a, over a human in length. And that's just one from one vine. Keep that in mind as well. But the other kind of uh, punch it packs is that it is in the legume family. So it's in the same family as peas, chickpeas, soybeans, that sort of thing. Um, and this family is actually incredibly good at fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. And we know 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. And because it is able to have a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria, that means it can fix 95% of its nitrogen needs, which is sent what makes the green on every plant. It, it's what grows the foliage of every plant. Um, it can fix that from the air and put it into its system, uh, which is insane because that would mean it can grow in very poor soil conditions, very sandy soils, hard clay soils. Um, you know, it can grow on anything, literally anything. If it can get its teeth into it, it's going to grow because it can nitrogen fix. And it's not a big fruiting plant. It's, it's not focusing a lot on flower growth or anything like that. So nitrogen is kind of the main ingredient to keep this thing going. So that is, is incredibly valuable too. It's uh, what makes it so aggressive and so great at what it does. Up to 40% of this plant's biomass is the root. And like when you look at the biomass of the plant on top, you're like 40%, there's more underground. And is there ever, you all, oh, I'll show you some photos. But some of these roots can get up to 12 feet in length. And they're not just these little spindly roots, 
they are honking tonking tuber roots like they look like giant sweet potatoes they're massive and there's reports of some of them weighing up to 300 pounds 300 pounds now the crazy part is is that a plant can grow out of any chunk of that root so if you take the soil from that area and a landscaping company or something is using that soil and then putting it into your garden or you know sharing it with you using it as backfill on your property anything like that and you have one chunk of kudzu root in it you officially will have a kudzu plant in your yard if it's within the first 12 inches of the of the soil surface it's getting light water everything you will have a kudzu plant very soon after so it doesn't take much um, for that to become a problem so why is it bad like why should we worry about this well besides the fact that it grows incredibly fast and it obviously is going to compete with native vegetation it is incredibly destructive it is very heavy plant and it is a vine so it climbs power poles it climbs light poles it climbs signs it climbs roads it climbs houses it climbs everything and it will pull it all down because it just keeps piling on top of itself um so that is a huge issue but those tap roots no one i didn't read this anywhere so i don't know exactly kind of the intensity of these roots but my my experience with roots is that roots are incredibly good at destruct destroying things they will go through cement if they need to if you've ever seen a tree penetrating cement it'll do it and so when i see a kudzu root that's 300 pounds and nearly 12 feet long i immediately think of just the underground infrastructure um, such as foundation of homes roads sidewalks um, just water pipelines natural gas pipelines oil pipelines just that sort of thing and just the fact that that root could very easily penetrate destroy wreck something even that substantial because roots are incredibly powerful powerful uh little buggers so i think of that and i think that that could probably cause a major issue as well fixes <laughs> And so in my notes, I put smiley faces and I'm literally laughing thinking about it right now, even just what you have to go through to get rid of this thing. And, uh, I, you know, from a science perspective, I'd be very willing to say it's impossible because it's just insane. It reminds me of Caragana in Saskatchewan. It's just, it's really hard to kill. It's, it's it's impossible to kill once it's there it's there type thing um so the recommendations that i've seen off of kind of cut to horticulture control folk is that you need to burn it um you need to first you need to mow it or you need to graze it and goats really like this stuff they love chewing on this stuff so goat grazing is really good it is very healthy for them as well um, but then after that you need to burn that land and you need to apply a heavy dose of herbicide and it's very specific what kind of herbicide you have to use because there's obviously a lot of other laws around what herbicides are applicable and not applicable based on you know water proximities etc and so forth but uh after that it's anywhere from seven to ten years of basically repeating that process over and over again and all your neighbors have to be on board with it as well because then it'll just move in within you know a year or two after you've completely finished it if your neighbor has it it's just coming back so um very labor intensive to get rid of this plant prevention um so i guess this would go for anyone who hasn't had it happen to them yet the the agricultural zones that this is deemed livable in is basically anything over a zone five so there's large portions of canada and the united states that this hasn't moved into yet that it definitely can move into so uh first one is don't plant seeds from places you don't know where it's from because you have no idea what kind of seeds those are uh that'd be number one number two uh don't buy plants that you you don't know what they are if they're not labeled properly um reputable nurseries reputable greenhouses things like that don't transport soil unless you just don't transport soil just don't do it it doesn't take much um, anyone who's bought soil from a landscape company that's had weeds in it um, such as wild oats for example knows exactly what soil can ha handle have in it 
Um, and if you end up with kudzu soil, then you'll be really screaming at your landscape company after that one. So yeah, just make sure that it's, it's as weed free as possible. And then uh, one that I haven't mentioned before and I keep on forgetting to add in is uh, hiking trails exist for a reason. Um, they exist in both provincial parks, national parks, regional parks for a reason. It's not just to control you and try to keep you off of the secret cool paths or area. It is actually to help you enjoy the native vegetation but without uh, causing any issues. So you'll notice on a lot of hiking trails, there's a lot of grooming that happens. So um, whether that be mechanical manipulation of the soil, additives of mulch or sand, for example. Um, but the reason for that is so that invasive species that come in on your shoelaces, the bottoms of your shoes, anything like that, aren't transferred into the surrounding area. So stay on your hiking trails, do not wander off of them. They're there for a reason. They're not there just to make your walk boring. There's an actual purpose to them. And one of those purposes is not to wreck the native fol foliage, but also to ensure that invasive species don't end up in an area of the park or of the forest that, that the uh, interpreters or the uh, ecological welfare management people don't know about and so that they're able to see immediately if something's moved in or not. So keep that in mind. Those trails are there for a reason. That's all I have for you guys on this creepy crawly video. If you guys are enjoying this series, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you've made it to the end, you clearly like me enough. So hit that subscribe button and join us on some awesome other adventures. And I will talk to you guys next time. If you have kudzu in your yard or farmland or whatever, I'd love to know if you have it, if you're controlling it, if you're letting it run rampant. I think it'd be interesting, but I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.